Uh, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce our uh, noontime speaker today, uh, Jason Chen. Uh, Jason did his uh, fellowship in infectious disease at the Cleveland Clinic and joined us in uh, 1999 where he completed his, oh, Case Western, oh, sorry, Case Western. Um, it came to us in 1999 um, when he joined us as a pulmonary and critical care medicine fellow. He um, also at that time uh, uh, did, uh, got his degree, his master's in epidemiology at the uh, University of Washington and has subsequently joined the faculty uh, as, an associate, uh, as an assistant member here and assistant professor at the University of Washington. Um, Jason's uh, area of research interest is in the clinical outcomes um, following uh, transplantation, uh, uh, stem cell transplantation, and uh, also in uh, studying the um, epigenetics of uh, uh, transplantation. So, uh, Jason, thank you. Oh, I'm gonna, thanks. Thanks, Dave. Okay. So, um, changing clinical practice and predicting the future, that's a kind of a, a, a big topic, but I'm going to start first with a little bit of art. art. Um, you know, as a pulmonary person, I was uh, particularly attracted to this piece of art, um, possibly because it, it uh, actually looks kind of like PFTs. <laughs> so it was very natural for me to be attracted to it. But, um, but actually, I, the reason I was attracted to it is because I often feel like these guys here down on the boat. Uh, especially when it comes to uh, clinical outcomes after transplant. Uh, this is definitely how I felt as a fellow. And uh, certainly when it comes to uh, changing pr medical practice, uh, as you guys know very well, changing medical practice is probably one of the hardest things that we do as uh, scientists. So um, I thought this was a, a nice appropriate way to represent the things that I might be, uh, I'm going to be talking about later on. So um, what I, I'll talk about today it falls within, I'd like you to think about in the context of early detection and prevention. And uh, doing this, I'm going to talk about a, a few um, uh, projects or anecdotes from the work that I've been doing. Uh, first, I'll talk about PFTs as a clinical biomarker. Um, this will involve the discussion of our early airflow decline in bronchiolitis obliterans. Uh, pre-transplant pulmonary function testing and uh, respiratory failure and mortality, and then finally how to predict how we use it to predict our morta uh, patients' mortality risks after transplant. Uh, then I'll uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about other biomarkers, and this includes some of the work that I've done so recently in a collaboration with a lot of investigators here looking at genetic biomarkers. And the phenotype that I'll discuss here today is uh, gram-negative bacteremia and mortality. And then finally, I just want to present some really uh, curious and interesting data that I recently presented at uh, ASBMT meeting uh, regarding the use of uh, uh, beclomethazone and the prevention of non-infectious pulmonary syndromes. So uh, first off, early airflow decline and bronchiolitis obliterans. So um, if you're a transplanter, you know that uh, this term very well, bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome. This is a... Uh, a, um, a form of fixed new airflow obstruction that generally develops within the first two years after allogeneic hematopoietic cell transplant. As most of you know, this, is, uh, this has been around with us for a long time, and uh, it's been presumed to be a pulmonary manifestation of chronic GVHD, although this has been never uh, biologically uh, defined. Uh, the prevalence is relatively rare. It's actually about 1 to 2 percent of our transplant patients, and, and this is uh, particularly difficult from a diagnostic pers perspective, not only because the prevalence is low, but also because the diagnosis uh, requires uh, interpretation of very nonspecific uh, clinical presentations, which include shortness of breath, dysphagia on exertion, some dry cough, wheezing, rails on exam, which uh, pretty much mimic anything that goes on in the lung. Uh, important things that we always know cl from the clinical perspective is that we have to rule out in respiratory infections and also evaluate radi radiologic um, assess, uh, findings to see if we can find changes that are consistent with bronchiolitis obliterans. And we also know that it's very important clinically because of its impact on mortality. It's been estimated that uh, at five years, uh, BO bronchiolitis obliterans patients' survival is about 10%. Now, um, 
There, there's been a couple recent studies that has been uh, very interesting from um, the perspective that we've been thinking about this. So I'll briefly present these two first stu two studies. Uh, first study was uh, from that I presented from University of Minnesota. This is from uh, Dan Weisdorf's group, and uh, I've got a lot of information here. But the bottom, uh, I'll present a couple main points. First, this was a very large study. They looked at 2,859 patients over uh, two decades, uh, over half of which were uh, allogeneic transplants. They did a very defined, well, def uh, very strict chart review with a very strict BOS definition. And what they found was uh, basically 47 cases of bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome. And the incidence here was uh, on par with what's been reported in the past, about 2% at one year and then 3% at uh, three years. Uh, it, through the study, they did find interesting risk factors, which I, I won't summarize too much here. And they talked a lot about response to therapy. But I thought what was interesting from this study were their analyses looking at mortality outcomes. Uh, first, what they found was that early development of the disease actually influenced outcomes. Uh, in, in this particular case, they found that people who developed disease very early on, less than six months, has, had a worse survival. So the first point here I'd like to point out to make is that uh, they clearly found that early diagnosis uh, may or may not may have a significant impact on the outcome after uh, development of this problem. The second thing is, is that uh, they demonstrated that achieving stability or progression or, prog or having progression of the disease is actually not enough to improve survival and that uh, you actually have to, to, uh, to achieve what they call response or reversal of the process to get any improvement in survival. And, and the point here that I want to make is that most of these people who responded were people who were treated early and very aggressively. So the, the main points here being that you have to diagnose early and try to treat aggressively and or as early as you can. The second study comes from the IBM, IBM TR database, and this was a study done uh, through uh, Mary Horwitz's group. Uh, this is, again, another very large study. It's a retrospective analysis of over 6,200 patients. And in this study, they found 70 cases of BOS. And again, the incidence was very similar to all the other studies, 1.7% at two years. Now, one of the main uh, findings of this study were uh, these risk factors for um, bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome. But again, I want to point out something very specific about that this study found. This study found that the majority of bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome or 80% of these cases were uh, discovered within the first 18 months after transplant. Suggesting that um, early after transplant, within this 18 months, uh, there may be a window of opportunity for either early detection and or treatment of this uh, process. And the reason that treatment early on is very important is that one of our clinical observations is that if you treat these diseases too late, what happens is that the, the airflow obstruction is fixed and it's very unlikely for us to be able to regain any lung function after a diagnosis. So in uh, 2003, I did a study to, to determine whether we can use another measure of uh, whether a patient develops this syndrome early on. And what, what we did was uh, we tried to define a rate of decline phenotype, which is to define early airflow obstruction looking at the rate of change of FAV1 over time. Now, at, at the center, we have access to a lot of pulmonary function tests, but the ones that were per pertinent to this study was the uh, PFT obtained at baseline and then the PFT obtained at one year at their follow-up. And, and, and then we actually also incorporated all the other PFTs that we had available after that first year, and we basically um, generated a least re uh, squares regression line and looked at the slope of this line. Um, categorizing patients as either having, having airflow obstruction or no airflow obstruction depending upon the rate of their change of FEV1. Uh, for this particular study, we set the cutoff at greater than 5% per year with a ratio that uh, was suggestive of an obstructive process, less than 0.8. Now, in this study, we found um, some, some of the classic uh, risk factors for um, developing bronchiolitis obliterans. Now, in this case, it's not bronchiolitis obliterans. It's simply early airflow obstruction. Uh, but the, the, the risk factors are similar. Older age of transplant, uh, worse lung function at transplant, the presence of Graf versus host disease, which has always been associated with development of bronchiolitis obliterans. But then something else new that we found in this study was a history of a respiratory viral infection within the first 100 days after transplant. A somewhat um, modest uh, increased risk, but nevertheless there. 
Uh, we follow this up with another study in conjunction with, um, with uh, Michael Book. In, where we looked at uh, the types of respiratory infections, viral infections, and whether it was uh, upper versus lower tract infection. What this study re revealed was that lower respiratory tract infection caused more severe airflow obstruction by day 100. And this is demonstrated by uh, the figure up here. This is a pre-transplanted, a change of FEV1 from pre-transplant to day 100. Uh, we also found that this airflow this change was uh, much more severe with uh, lower tract infections as evidenced by RSV and parainfluenza uh, infections here versus the upper tract infections. You can see uh, these changes are uh, definitely uh, significantly di uh, different from the upper tract infections. We also found that by looking at the day 100 to one year data, we, can, we demonstrated that the change is actually fixed, meaning if you look at the change between day 100 and one year, there's really essentially no change, suggesting that all of the changes that's observed at one year was likely attributable to uh, events that occurred during that first 100 days related to these viral infections. In fact, uh, a lower tract para, uh, parainfluenza infection was associated with an 18-fold increase in risk of fair, fixed airflow obstruction at one year. In the same study, we also demonstrated that uh, that this early airflow decline phenotype also has other significant clinical implications, which is that by one year, it's associated with a 2.3-fold increase in risk of mortality after transplant. Here I give you the survival curves, but here I also give you the attributable mortality rates, which are adjusted for other um, common causes of uh, death after transplant. These are one-year, five-year, and ten-year estimates. As you can see, um, the effect of early airflow decline can be observed even 10 years out after transplant. The, the, the rate of, um, the, the increased risk of mortality is uh, by about 18%. Among the patients with chronic GVHD, it's uh, even more um, obvious. It's by about 40% at 10 years. Now, the, the, fo the follow-up question to this study was whether we can make these observations earlier on. So as you, as I shown you before, we had lots of pulmonary function tests, but in the previous study, what we did was we dropped out, we did not analyze the day 100 PFT, and, and, and that was mostly because at the time, the belief was that day 100 PFTs um, were not very accurate in the sense that they, uh, they're, it's a relatively noisy measurement because of the, um, the, the effects that you tend to observe in association with uh, post -trans, early post-transplant issues. But we went back and now looked at uh, day 100 pulmonary function tests and also the one-year PFT. And what we basically did was look at the rate of change between baseline to day 100 and then from baseline to one year and was able to categorize patients according to whether they have early airflow ch decline changes um, at these, in these two different time points according to yes versus no. Uh, again, we used the same cutoff as before, 5%, an, an annualized rate of 5% per, greater than 5% per year to define our uh, cases. Uh, this is just the survival curve. The bottom line is that patients, uh, they, there was a distinction in terms of the, the uh, survival, uh, survival of these patients based upon their categorization. Uh, I wanted to, the, the point and point I make here is that patients who um, were detected, who had their airflow obstruction detected later in the second group, tended to have the lower, um, lower survival rates. This is more obvious here in this table, where I present the actual um, uh, mortality rates. As you can see, patients who, um, who had their airflow, who, who did not have any airflow obstruction during the first 100 days, but then was later on detected to have it uh, at one year, had the highest risk for uh, or highest mortality rate at, um, at all three time points. Uh, this is also true for people who had early airflow obstruction that continued to one year, but not quite as severe as the ones who were detected very late. late. Uh, these data suggest that um, early detection may actually facilitate earlier therapy, as, as you can see here, where the people who had uh, their disease detected earlier had uh, much better survival rates. Uh, the point that I try to make with this study is that uh, diagnosis is, er is, is, is probably important to be as early as possible and that treatment should be early or at least consideration for prophylaxis in, um, in these high-risk patients should be uh, made. 
Now, some of this uh, work has uh, definitely led to some, I think, useful changes in terms of uh, patient management. Um, we've, I've been able to um, have the opportunity to make some recommendations to the NIH, and uh, this has uh, resulted in the NIH consensus recommendations for a diagnosis of bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome. What we've been able to do is basically um, uh, make the definition less severe at, than it used to be. So now we, we simply require that an FEV1 less than or equal to 75% um, be the cutoff for development of uh, or def defining someone with having bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome. Now, I will say that ideally it would be nice to be able to compare pre-transplant and post-transplant PFTs and simply look at that rate of change. Unfortunately, it, um, at that time, um, changing that practice um, was an additional challenge, meaning asking uh, clinicians out there to look at both PFTs and coming up with a rate of change was uh, much more challenging than simply giving them a, um, a, a, a threshold for them to uh, categorize their patients with. And therefore, we decided to go with this first. But I believe that uh, with the next, hopefully with the next uh, round of uh, alterations in definition, we might consider something that relates to a, a rate of change. This, um, this work has also been able to um, direct some um, um, or, or guide the development of algorithms for following lung function tests. And I'm not going to go through this entire th uh, flow sh chart, but basically what it does is it uh, it suggests to clinicians out there that PFTs, or pulmonary function tests, should be monitored relatively frequently, probably uh, every three months within the first year. And we've basically been able to set up parameters by which uh, people can direct their uh, monitoring as well as their uh, interventions based upon the degree of change in, uh, in their uh, lung function test. And finally, I just want to summarize real briefly in one slide here that uh, this Airflow obstruction phenotype actually preceded a lot of um, a work that we've been doing on the genetic front. Uh, what we did using this airflow obstruction phenotype was uh, a candidate uh, pathway analysis looking at innate immunity response genes. Uh, in, in this study, we looked at uh, approximately f uh, 15 to 18 genes in the innate immune pathway using a haplotype-based approach. and uh, Basically, what I'm, I, what I'm demonstrating here is that using this haplotype analysis demonstrated a very significant um, association with uh, genetic variation over the, whoops, the, uh, the BPI gene, as demonstrated by this peak here. Uh, the, the patient's uh, SNP haplotypes and BPI was associated with a three to eight-fold increase in air, their risk of airflow obstruction. Now, the interesting thing here was that it was uh, the uh, BPI haplotype of the patient and not the donor, but in fact, uh, most of what was known about BPI up to that time point was that BPI was produced by the neutrophils and not by any other um, uh, somatic cells other than um, a gut epithelial cells. We then uh, pursued another study to look at um, the, uh, whether airway epithelial cells, which is really the, the site of disease for uh, bronchiolitis obliterans, uh, might produce BPI, and sure enough, we were, we were able to demonstrate that um, um, airway epithelial cells here, be, uh, A549 cells, as well as small airway epithelial cells, produce BPI, uh, demonstrated here. And then finally, you, using uh, immunofluorescence, we were able to demonstrate that as well. Uh, these, these work are uh, currently uh, ongoing in the lab to define exactly what BPI does in airway epithelial cells. So I'll switch gears here and talk about pre-transplant pulmonary function tests. Uh, moving that window back even further to see if we can use them, use pulmonary function to, uh, as a biomarker to, de to uh, determine the risk for other outcomes after transplant. So as many of you know, uh, most of the, uh, the, the, the uh, clinical trials now use uh, DLCO as a criteria for um, De determining whether a patient is eligible for various different um, uh, transplant clinical trials. And that mostly is uh, based upon work that was done by Steve Crawford back in 1992 here at this center, where he demonstrated that DLCO and not, uh, not the other parameters was uh, significantly associated with uh, increased mortality and respiratory failure after transplant. The thing is, is that there's been a lot of studies out there looking at uh, this issue, it's, and uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a simple um, 
or a table that simply uh, tallies exactly what studies have been done. But the point that I'd like to make here is that uh, all these studies, unfortunately, looked at many different parameters uh, using many different cohorts, and their associations were not always the same, meaning that there was a lot of conflicting data regarding what pre-transplant pulmonary function parameters should really be considered when we look at our patients. In a study that was done in collaboration with uh, Reiner and uh, Brenda, uh, we looked at uh, pulmonary function or, or outcomes uh, re in relation to pulmonary functions, comparing uh, myeloblative versus non-myeloblative regimens uh, for transplant. Uh, this study was really informative for me because of um, this particular uh, observation. That is, among myeloblative patients, 100% of the patients who had the worst lung function, meaning FEV1 less than 60%, died within the first two years after transplant. Uh, seeing this suggested to, to me that PFTs here, not just DLCO, might be uh, very informative when we are thinking about the risks that our patients face after transplant. So this prompted us to do an additional study, where we, a, a much bigger study, where we looked at all pulmonary function test parameters between 1990 and 2001. This gave us about 2,800 patients. This is a simple uh, tally of uh, what sort of pulmonary function we usually observe prior to transplant. As you can see, majority of our patients, based on their pre-transplant parameters, um, have normal lung function after trans uh, prior to transplant. And that's defined by a percent of the predicted normal level greater than 80%. Um, it should be also noted that uh, there are there are a reasonable pr number of patients who have uh, less than pr pristine lungs prior to transplant, as we all know, but only about 6% of the patients had an obstructive pattern pre-transplant. And in fact, uh, the, the, the majority of patients that had abnormal lung function had uh, actually a restrictive pattern prior to transplant. I then, uh, we then, uh, continue this, this analysis, and this was done, this was, uh, the, the, most of this work has been done by, uh, I just want to mention, um, Tanya Lock Paramon, a pulmonary fellow at the time, um, uh, a couple years ago. She, what she did was she uh, basically looked at all these pulmonary function parameters and basically uh, analyzed them according to uh, two different outcomes. Early respiratory failure, which was defined as the need for mechanical ventilation within the first 120 days after transplant, and then uh, death after transplant. And as you can see, in univariate analysis here, uh, there was definitely a significant association between all of these, each of these parameters and uh, the re early respiratory failure outcome. In multivariate analysis, this becomes um, quite clear that basically, as you, uh, your lung function worsens or progresses through these uh, categories, your risk for mortality increases. And there was, a, for the most part, a nice stepwise increase in mortality risk. So uh, in contrary to the earlier data, not, not only did the L DLCO, um, was, not only was the DLCO associated with um, the worst outcomes, so were the other parameters, FEV1, FEC, TLC, and uh, the A difference. The data was pretty much similar for uh, mortality. Uh, again, in univariate analysis, all of the variables were associated with mortality outcome, and then in, um, in uh, time to event analysis, multivariate time to event analysis, we find the same stepwise progression in terms of the increased risk for mortality. So this work, um, however, um, was, uh, I guess, hindered by the fact that there are so many parameters in pulmonary function tests, and what we wanted to do was present something that was easier for clinicians to use. As we also knew from a pulmonary perspective, there is a lot of there's a lot of um, um, there's a there's a lot of uh, a correlation between the pulmonary function test. So what we did was basically a series of analyses that found that FEV1 and DLCO were likely the most informative. Well, and uh, using these two parameters, we generated what was called the pre-transplant lung function score, where we scored the FEV1 and DLCO based upon their how they fit into these categories, and then basic and then added the numbers for these two. Uh, two values. So such that if you had an FEV1 of 80% or, or 81% and DLC of 81%, your, your score would be 2, as, as opposed to a higher score, which would mean that you have a worse lung function. We then, I'm sorry, we, we, we then uh, were able to simply categorize them. 
according to the, the lump function score as normal, mildly decreased, moderately decreased, or severely decreased. And using that approach, we basically looked at our same um, outcomes again and demonstrated that now there was a very nice stepwise um, progression in terms of the risk as you go up in the categories. Such that, for instance, uh, if you're in category four, your risk for early respiratory failure was uh, threefold higher than if you were in category one, and uh, your mortality was similar. Mortality risk was similar. Um, we, we also were able to look at mortality curves according to all these parameters, and as you can see, the lung function score, although, the, uh, although these were all very significant, the lung function score provided a very nice uh, breakdown of the different curves in terms of um, survival after transplant. <coughs> now, what might be um, the reason why these, these early lung function change or, or pre-transplant abnormalities be a cause of mortality after transplant? This is a work that we recently presented at ASPMT um, looking at uh, pre-transplant respiratory muscle dysfunction and post-transplant outcomes. So as I mentioned before, about 9% of the patients prior to transplant had uh, evidence of a restrictive uh, pattern on their pulmonary function test, and that's simply defined as a, by a DLCO less than 80%. Now, um, this is a pretty rough um, criteria in terms of, thinking of, of identifying patients with what we think might be uh, might have respiratory muscle dysfunction, which is our, was our, uh, our hypothesis as to why these patients might do worse. So what we did was perf um, set up a series of different definitions for sen sensitivity analysis where we added other parameters that, that might help us uh, define a more specific definition for uh, respiratory muscle weakness. First, we, we uh, looked at FEV1, FEC, where um, a ratio greater than 0.7 helped us to further define uh, patients with respiratory muscle weakness dysfunction. And then we actually went and reviewed all of the radiographic findings that the patients had um, at the time the PFTs were performed and categorized them as, having, as, as whether they were low or high probability of having abnormalities that cause restriction. And, um, and in, in this situation, patients with a, who were categorized as having a low probability were actually more likely to have respiratory muscle dysfunction as an ex explanation for the restrictive pattern versus someone who had, say, fibrosis of their pulmonary function on their um, CT scan, for instance, that would, have, would more likely have that as the explanation for their uh, restrictive pattern. Using these definitions, we uh, then did some simple analyses to look at the risk um, associated with the, pre the, the restrictive pattern. As you can see, uh, a very general definition here was again associated with an increased risk for respiratory failure after transplant. And this um, became, it came down slightly as we uh, increased the specificity of the definition, but clearly there was still a significant association with uh, early respiratory after transplant. In addition, we also looked at mortality, and the, the findings were very similar. Um, presence of what we would call as a uh, probable or high probability of having uh, respiratory muscle weakness was associated with a two-fold, almost two-fold increase in risk for mortality after transplant. Uh, this is also a, a quite um, uh, distinct when you look at these survival curves. This is the sur uh, survival curve for respiratory failure, and this is the survival curve for uh, mortality. Now, the, the most likely... Uh, a uh, confounding factor that we have to consider is what, is, is, is what else, all these other things that might um, cause restriction as well as increase your risk for mortality. Um, and it turns out that the patient's disease risk is actually a very good surrogate measure of these uh, potential confounding fa factors. And that includes um, advanced intrathoracic malignant lesions, spinal cord compression, prior chemotherapy, prior thoracic surgery, uh, prior radiation, and also chronic respiratory diseases or infections, as well as deconditioning. In fact, one might argue if you uh, adjust for these, that you might be over-adjusting um, in the model. Nevertheless, we, we decided that um, taking these into account would basically bias, bias us towards the null, and if we were able to find an effect, this would be uh, quite interesting. So using, by incorporating uh, disease risk into our models, we were able to demonstrate that the presence of uh, respiratory muscle weakness 
was still associated with a significant increased risk in respiratory failure as well as mortality. Now another um, um, aspect of this work that, that has influenced some of our, um, hopefully at least more and more of our cl clinical practice is the development of this lung function score. Now at the time when the NIH consensus uh, meetings occurred, uh, we had not done any studies to look at um, how the lung function score might perform after transplant. But nevertheless, the, the, the pre-transplant data was enough to uh, prompt us to consider at least modifying it for, uh, to develop a modified lung function score as a criteria for um, judging whether there's been significant changes in lung function after transplant, either for uh, simple clinical, clinical monitoring or for clinical trials. And here what we did basically was, um, again, categorize FEV1 and DLCO according to their percent of the predicted normals um, based on these categories and then simply tally them up uh, or add them and tally them up to break them down into these four categories. Jason? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> you guys should, uh, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm sorry about that. So um, FEV1 is forced expiratory volume in one second. And uh, so basically when we do a lung function test, we ask someone to in, inhale as much air as they can into the lungs, and then we ask them to blow it out as fast as they can. And the FEV1 is the forced expiratory volume in that first second during all of that, um, that entire um, uh, expiration, which usually takes about seven seconds. Um, it's a, it's a, um, a, a measure, basically, of, uh, allows us to, it's a surrogate for, the me, for, the measure, for measuring the caliber of the airways. So for instance, in an asthmatic or somebody with emphysema with airways disease, this number would drop in proportion to all of the lung volume that comes out of the lungs in seven seconds. Um, DLCO is a diffusion capacity of the carbon monoxide. So we also measure the ability to exchange gases across uh, the lungs. And uh, by breathing, we, we ask the patients to breathe, uh, breathe in a very specific concentration of carbon monoxide. And then we, we uh, basically measure the ex exhale content. And that allows us to, to uh, to have a measure of how well the lungs exchange gases. Um, there are a lot of other measurements that we also do, like the total lung capacity, the TLC, the forced vital capacity, the FVC, uh, residual volume, the RV. Uh, those, uh, a lot of these things do with, uh, have, have to do with uh, measuring lung volumes as opposed to what we call spirometry, which is FEV1. Uh, I, I probably should have gone over that first, the second slide that I had of that, that curve, but um, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> Um, so back to this, so, uh, so the, what we found in this analysis, uh, which was done by uh, Eric Walter, another pulmonary fellow currently working in the lab, was that the modified lung function, and w w we applied the modified lung function score to day 80 PFTs, which is uh, the first um, opportunity we have to assess our patient's lung function after transplant. And uh, looking at these data, we, we found that their lung function at day 80 after transplant based on the lung function score, again, was um, uh, in very informative in terms of their five-year risk, five risk for mortality, such that if your lung function is in the worst category, you're, increased, you're at a higher increased risk for mortality after transplant. And for lung function score category, this was um, also quite uh, significant, uh, such that if you were in the worst category, your uh, risk was five-fold higher than someone in uh, the lowest category. Now the other interesting that thing that came up came out up out of this analysis was um, that if you just if you looked at the C statistic, uh, these values here, which is basically a uh, area under the curve for a time to event analysis, the the FEV1, the DLCO, and the lung function score actually functioned very similarly, uh, which actually was a relief because at the time when we developed the modified lung function score. We had actually suggested that if people did not have access to DLCO measurements, which is actually much more involved, then um, they can just use an FEV1. An FEV1 is actually very simple to measure. It's, uh, it, it takes about five minutes. It can actually be done in any um, office. And we actually have portable spirometers that are about this big uh, 
where patients can take home and measure their own lung function. So in, in the event that DLCO is not available or there are some cost issues, um, FEV1 is actually very informative in terms of, uh, of, of how their lungs are doing actually looks like mortality risk. So we, at the time when we finished that initial project looking at pre-transplant lung function and respiratory failure and mortality, we wanted to take this one step further because um, although as a pulmonologist we love pulmonary function tests, we, uh, I knew, I felt in my gut that it really wasn't fair for us to judge a patient's risk purely based on their lung function and clearly there are a lot of other issues um, at play prior to transplant. So we wanted to do and, and this became uh, really clear in that, in that first study by, done by uh, Tanya Locke when we looked at these curves where, um, again, patients who received a myeloblative regimen whose lung function score was in the worst category, um, none of them survived to two years after transplant. Again, suggesting that um, uh, lung function should probably, is, is probably very important but should be taken in consideration with, um, for instance, their transplant regimen. The hypothesis that we had for this project was that standard clinical laboratory biomarkers uh, available prior to transplant can be used to predict the mortality risk after transplant. And our challenge to, to ourselves was to construct a very simple but easily accessible tool that can predict the patient's risk. Uh, a quick summary of our study design here, basically we took about 12 years worth of data. We, uh, we split it up into a development cohort and a validation cohort. And then we subsequently developed two, um, two validation cohorts, sub-cohorts, sub early versus late, based upon when uh, non-myeloblative transplants started at our center. And then we also uh, set up three other validation cohorts based upon the patient's diagnosis. Uh, first, we used the development cohort to identify all the pre-transplant clinical risk factors that, uh, that appear to predict mortality uh, prior to, uh, after transplant. And we, for this we came up with basically eight variables. Eight, age at the time of transplant, donor type, disease risk, conditioning regimen, their uh, renal function, their liver function, and then their, the, uh, the lung function score basically, the FEV1 and DLCO. We then um, applied these to the uh, validation cohorts. And here I, I'll give you, these are the data for the early validation, late validation cohort, chronic uh, my CML, AML, and uh, MDS syndrome patients. And the bottom line here is, whoops, the bottom line here is that in this last column you can see that the hazard rate ratios all uh, increase in a stepwise fashion as you increased in the, uh, the PAM score category. Uh, in fact, someone in the highest category had uh, eight to tenfold increase in risk of mortality after transplant. And this outcome was two-year mortality for this particular project. Oops, sorry. We then uh, looked at uh, model fit and as well as, well as model performance and, and here simply to demonstrate that the C statistics or again the AUC was, uh, was quite robust. It was ranged from 0.69 to 0.76 based on uh, which validation, depending upon which validation cohort you looked at. These are uh, survival curves. So how might this be applied clinically and how have we been using it on the transplant service? So here's a clinical case, a 45-year-old man with AML in remission scheduled to receive a match-related donor non-TBI-based uh, myeloblative transplant. Um, the, their PFTs are here, FEV1 60%, DLCO 90%, um, relatively uh, mildly increased, uh, I'm sorry, normal liver, uh, liver function but mildly increased uh, creatinine. Now, I picked this case in particular because this is the sort of challenge we used to tend to, to see quite often, or we, we see quite often on the clinical service, which is, you know, their DLC is normal, meaning that by the Crawford criteria, they meet um, the criteria for entering a clinical trial, but their FEV1 is 60%. So how do you interpret that, or how do you um, make a prediction or, or judgment in terms of their risk for transplant? So, so given these characteristics, we, ha we had to come up with, a, we, we can now come up with a probability that the patient will die within the first two years after transplant. Um, what we've done to make this, uh, facilitate this is to create a website called the PAM score calculator. Um, here it is, a screenshot. Um, on the screen, basically, you can use drop-down tools to easily select all the characteristics. 
And once you've punched in the numbers, you can hit this button here, and this is what will pop out. You'll get the PAM score. You'll get the overall probability of death within the two year, first two years after transplant. And for this particular patient, uh, it was 70% with uh, this confidence interval. And then we can give you the sensitivity and the specificity. As you can see, this score is um, highly specific. Uh, the, the, this this uh, website has actually seen quite a bit of activity. We average about 110 hits per month since uh, publication. We're coming up on our two-year anniversary. And I've had a lot of contact with people all over the world who are uh, currently trying to validate this. And hopefully, we'll see some validation data come up soon. So now I'll, I'll switch gears quickly to uh, genetic risk factors for gram-negative bacteremia, a, another uh, project that we've been using working on to identify risk factor, uh, other forms of biomarkers that could be useful clinically. Now, this is obviously a completely different pulmonary function test, but we are looking at, we will be looking at some endpoints that are very similar. Uh, this particular project focused on something called lipopolysaccharide binding protein. And the clinical motivation here is that we suspect, we know that innate immunity has a, a, plays a very significant role in gram-negative infections. And in fact, um, um, LPS, which is a um, common product of all gram-negative cell walls, is uh, processed by LBP. LBP is very important in mediating the LPS signaling. And, and LP, LBP is particularly interesting because um, it has a dual role. So if LBP levels in the cir or circulating levels are, is within the normal to, middle, to um, decreased range, it actually facilitates the, uh, the pro-inflammatory response to LPS. However, if the levels are very high in the circulation. It actually uh, promote, or, or causes an anti-inflammatory response to LPS, suggesting that a very tight regulation of the, um, the, the level of this protein in the blood is very important. For this study, what we did was a, a, a three-stage study design where we first did a retrospective nested uh, exposure mass case control study to identify all the relevant clinical covariates that are important in, in uh, gram-negative bacteremia. And then we then, from this group, we selected cases and controls to do the genetic association study and multivariate analysis. And finally, we, we uh, validated the study with using another prospective cohort of uh, about 250 people. Uh, this is simply a, a summary of all of the organism, gram-negative organisms that we looked at. Um, in, the, in the first part of the study, we again did uh, we, we did this uh, retrospective analysis of clinical variables, and we identified uh, that gender match, uh, disease risk, total, total body present or re receiving total body radiation, CMV serostatus, status, their pre whether there was pre-transplant neutropenia, um, neutropenia after initial engraftment, and then the presence of acute and chronic graft versus host disease were all significantly associated with gram-negative bacteremia after transplant, and then. Using a tag SNP approach, uh, we identified uh, markers across the entire LBP gene that would help us um, perform the association study. So just real briefly here, this is what we call a, a, um, a visual genotype. Um, these are individuals that were sequenced for, by a, um, uh, actually Debbie, Debbie Nickerson's group uh, for this gene. These are normal controls. And then across the top, we have um, all the SNPs that were discovered across this gene. Uh, however, as, as some of you might know, you know it's e due to linkage to sequilibrium, you can actually look at haplotypes across the entire gene. And this is what basically we're trying to show here, is basic, uh, blue being the uh, homozygous wild type, red being the, um, the, um, the uh, heterozygotes, and then yellow being the homozygous rare. Uh, looking at this, it's pretty clear that there's a pattern across this entire gene where there are basically three uh, SNP haplotypes, such that we are able to s select one SNP per haplotype and get information across the entire gene in our analysis. These are the SNPs that we selected. Bottom line here is this, that we, one of our tag SNPs, 6878, was significantly associated with a two-fold increase in risk of developing gram-negative bacteremia. And this was significant even even after we uh, restricted analysis to Caucasians, um, as demonstrated by a p-value of 0 0.002. Now, what's interesting about this tag SNP, going back to the visual haplotype, is that, whoops, that um, it, it tags the first haplotype. The, and in that haplotype, the first three SNPs are actually within the promoter region. 
And in fact, uh, 1683, uh, this first one here, uh, sits in a cat box at position 778. And it turns out that in a previous study done by another group in Europe, what they've been able to demonstrate is that if you truncate the promoter at or around this region, you, you get a threefold increase in promoter activity, suggesting that there's probably some sort of a sil silencing sequence that are in this region that affects the, um, the, the, uh, the protein response to LP LPS or other inflammatory um, uh, cytokines. Based on this, we hypothesize that 1683 is probably a functional variant that affects the efficiency of the promoter. In our prospective analysis, we aim to, to uh, basically demonstrate this. And in this study, we found that we used uh, 250 stem cell transplant patients' uh, whole blood, which was collected prior to transplant. And uh, we measured the plasma levels LBP using a, a simple ELISA and genotyped each of these patients for SNP 1683. And here is basically a summary of the data, which is that um, SNP 1683, the minor allele of the 1683, was associated with a significant increase in uh, circulating levels of LBP. In fact, uh, the homozygous um, uh, rares had a two-fold increase in terms of the circulating LBP level. The other really interesting aspect of this study was that if you looked at outcomes, um, and we knew that we were underpowered to look at gram-negative bacteremia because the incidence is uh, no more than 10% in our population. And in a, cohort 250, we weren't going to get more than 25 cases. However, we could look at mortality. And when we did a stratified analysis based on whether the patients had gram-negative bacteremia, the patients with the minor allele had the most significant increased risk for mortality after, um, after transplant. And among the patients with gram-negative bacteremia was almost a, was a five, almost a five-fold increase in risk. Um, notably, even among the patients who did not have gram-negative bacteremia, uh, the hazard ratio was 2.5 in the same direction, although we didn't have enough power to achieve the 0.05 threshold. So currently we're doing some uh, validation work to, to look at this uh, association with mortality, and it seems that so f some initial analysis suggests that this is a true association. And, and one hypothesis might be that because of the involvement of, of um, innate immunity in, for instance, graft versus host disease, this might be a very important protein involved in uh, that process. I'm going to skip that real quick. So the last uh, 10 minutes I'm going to cover uh, some really interesting data about uh, non-infectious pulmonary syndromes. As uh, many of you know, uh, non-infectious pulmonary syndromes after transplant, such as idiopathic pneumonia syndrome, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, hemorrhage is very devastating to uh, stem cell transplant patients. The associated mort mortality risk or mortality rate is about 75% for uh, patients who develop IPS. Um, it was very fortuitous that um, um, George McDonald actually came to me with some observations that he made in the P BDP uh, randomized trials that he conducted over the last decade. So as, as oral um, beclomethasone dipropanate, or BDP, is um, a, to a topically active glucocorticoid prodrug that is metabolized to this highly potent metabolized 17 BMP in the gut. And uh, George has been able to conduct two randomized studies, which basically demonstrated there was a very sig uh, a significant benefit of using BDP in the transplant population. The oral, oral BDP was effective in uh, treating GI, graft versus host disease. Oral BDP rapidly um, allows a rapid taper of the prednisone therapy, which in the combination of these probably redu uh, explains the re a 60% reduction in mortality risk among the patients who receive BDP. The one observation that, uh, interesting observation that George made was that fewer non-infectious pulmonary infiltrates occurred in the BDP arm of the uh, phase three trial. And this prompted us to start thinking about whether um, uh, there might be some interesting information here regarding uh, non-infectious pulmonary syndromes. Therefore, we hypothesize that oral BDP may prevent the development of non-infectious pulmonary syndromes. Uh, this is the basic layout of the two randomized trials. Um, patients uh, who developed uh, graver, GI graft versus host disease were randomized to receive prednisone plus BDP or prednisone with placebo for 10 days. And then after 10 days, uh, a taper with, of the prednisone was initiated. So therefore, in both studies, the patients received or ex were exposed to BDP on average of 30 to 50 days. 
Uh, in this study, what we did was basically conduct a retrospective analysis of data collected for the 120 Fred Hutch patients who participated in a randomized trial. The outcome, we uh, had two major outcome measures. First, we looked at the change in pulmonary function parameters from pre-transplant to day 80. Um, well, here, we, required that, we arbitrarily required that patients who, uh, who received study drug uh, for less than five days uh, were not uh, included in the analysis to make sure that there was sufficient exposure. We also looked at clinical pulmonary events, and these were categorized into either infectious or non-infectious based upon a retrospective chart review. So the, the comparison of the um, FEV or the PFT data demonstrated that fewer BDP tra patients treated, experienced a um, decrease of their diffusion capacity by day 80 after transplant. So if you look at FEV1, FVC, and TLC, the proportion of patients who um, experienced a, a, ch a change um, was really not statistically, statistically significant. It was relatively uh, similar. However, if you look at uh, DLCO, uh, it becomes um, um, apparent that more of the patients who received the placebo had a decrease of their DLCO than the patients who received BDP. If we look at uh, non-infectious pulmonary events that, uh, after transplant, it, it becomes, it, it's clear here from this um, cumulative incidence graph that uh, there were absolutely no events in the oral BDP treated arm. However, in the placebo treated arm, there were four uh, events, three of which were all uh, idiopathic pneumonia syndrome. The first one was BOOP, which um, is also treated, or, or a cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, another non-infectious uh, syndrome which is usually treated with uh, high-dose steroids as well. Now, the, in, the, in this, in this uh, we truncated the analysis at 200 because this was one of the um, data endpoint analyses, uh, or, data, or time points for a data analysis in the original study. But if you, to be fair, we should look at all the data within that first year. And as, as you can see from this slide, um, the the, the events in the uh, BDP treated arm appear to occur after day 200. Now, the, to me, this suggests that, that maybe there is um, a, a, a time course to this drug and it, the effect of the drug might actually wear off just around day 200 because most of this, these people, again, were only treated for uh, 30 to 50 days. Uh, just in the BDP arm, these were the events that occurred after day 200. And again, these are all... Um, pulmonary non-infectious events that are traditionally treated with high-dose steroids. There was also no significant difference in the cumulative in incidence of uh, infectious pulmonary events as demonstrated by this, uh, this graph. However, there was a survi the, the survival probability was higher for the BDP-treated patients. Um, if you again truncate the data at day 200, uh, the p-value is significant at 0 0.03, where uh, the hazard ratio was 0.34 for the BDP-treated patients. However, if you look out to one year, the, the p-value uh, increased slightly to 0 0.08, but again, the, the, um, the trend was in the same exact direction. The hazard ratio was 0 0.53. Now, in, you know, in the, again, this study, this was restricted to the Fred Hutch patients, and there were only 120 patients in this analysis. I'm not surprised by that p-value of 0 0.08. So why might uh, seven, uh, BDP work in, in uh, preventing non-infectious pulmonary syndromes? Well, it turns out that 17 BMP is actually delivered di directly delivered to the lung via the pulmonary artery. So this is how it might work. Oral BDP is uh, taken by mouth, and it goes to the gut, where it's hydrolyzed in the gut to a 17 BMP, the active metabolite. This then is, uh, goes via a portal circulation to the liver, where its continu continued hydro hydrolysis occurs and even more is converted to 17 BMP. This then circulates through the heart, uh, through the pulmonary artery, and it's delivered directly to the, uh, circulation, the pulmonary artery circulation in the lung. Now, we, we also have uh, direct evidence that this is actually true. So it turns out that in the, stu in the study, four patients from the Fred Hutch actually had um, uh, 17 BMP levels measured from their Hickman catheter, which is essentially uh, the right atrium or another uh, just before the pulmonary artery. So after two milligrams of oral BDP, uh, these are the levels of uh, 17 BMP that you see within the uh, atrium, which is, as you can see, very high levels and able to achieve uh, nice steady states at 800 picograms per mil 
um, at 12 hours. Uh, we, also, uh, we also know that 17 BMP's uh, affinity for the glucocorticoid receptor um, alpha is much, much, much higher than a methylprednisolone. It's about 30 fold higher. And this is uh, based on some um, uh, PK study that, PK studies, or, or some, I'm sorry, some, um, some uh, studies that were done to look at the binding affinity of um, BDP. So if you assume dexamethasone binding affinity is 100, BDPs is about 43. Now, remind, just to remind you, BDP, again, is inactive. But 17 BMP, the active metabolite, its binding relative to dexamethasone is, is a 13-fold higher. Now, if you compare that to methylprednisolone, or what we standardly use to treat all these non-infectious syndromes, the binding affinity of, of that is much, much lower than a BMP. Now, the, the, the attraction for using 17 BMP is, um, is that basically once it passes through the lung, almost none of it appears on the systemic side, which means that you have very, very few of the complication that's usually associated with prednisone. Um, and, and in a situation where we have almost uniformly very high mortality rates in, in this syndrome, uh, the, the uh, idea of being able to prevent it ra rather than treating it when, once it, it's developed is very attractive. So these data are, uh, are uh, definitely very interesting, and uh, I think w the, the jury is, should be still out for now. Um, so p where are we going to get additional data? Well, actually, um, Paul Martin is con currently uh, leading a phase two study to evaluate the efficacy of uh, BDP in the, in the prevention of acute gravis host disease after transplant. And in this study, uh, the treatment duration is, is about 75 days from day zero to day 75 with the same exact BD, BDP dose in, as in the original two studies. And we'll have all of the same evaluable pulmonary outcomes. We'll look at pulmonary function tests at day 80, as also at one year. And we'll also, again, look at pulmonary events. So hopefully after, uh, we'll, we'll get some data from this in, uh, in a couple years, and hopefully actually it'll end next summer, and then we'll get some initial analyses shortly thereafter to uh, get the final results. So in summary, um, along this line of uh, early detection and prevention, I, uh, what I wanted to show you were these, or point out to you are these uh, f five major points. Uh, first, we can identify clinical and molecular and genetic biomarkers for early detection of transplant-related complications. So plenty of biomarkers to evaluate. But I think more, more definitely, um, or, or more informative biomarkers are definitely also coming down the pike. Um, Using this approach, we can develop clinical guidelines and tools to direct clinical management of transplant patients. Uh, and, and as another um, a result of this approach, we can elucidate novel pathways that may be involved in the pathogenesis of transplant-related complications, such a, as those we've shown in uh, LBP studies. And finally, uh, and then the last two points, uh, the goal really here is to be able to conduct clinical trials that, to, that can uh, assess whether these biomarkers interventions can improve the transplant outcomes and then hopefully actually take it beyond the transplant population, at least from a pulmonary and critical care perspective, where we can apply these biomarkers and therapeutic discoveries to non-transplant populations. And uh, with that, I just want to make sure to, to acknowledge all of um, the, the huge number of people that have uh, helped me with this, this work. Uh, the, in the far left column are a summary of most of the uh, pulmonary people that have uh, that helped me, helped me do most of this work, including I'd like to recognize the pulmonary fellows that uh, contributed significantly, including Tony Lock Perriman and uh, Eric Walters. Um, there's also been a lot of great collaborators here from the oncology side, and then as well as the uh, statistical side. And finally, we're just starting to, with the genetic studies, really um, tap into our resources at the PHS and some great collaborators in the uh, Luping Ping uh, Statistical Genetics Group. Thank you. Actually, I think I'd like to start if there's no one jumping in. Uh, when you look at your BDP uh, data, it looks like what's happened is that the timeline to the complication has simply been pushed out. Right. And so do you have a sense for whether or not this is having a cytoprotective effect that maybe helps to pr protect the uh, pulmonary vascular bed, the endothelial bed, um, 
from the toxicities of chemo radiation, or do you think we're sort of pro postponing an immunologic event? Uh, that's a great question, and uh, I don't know. I, th I think um, the I, th I think one potential hypothesis is that um, there there is a uh, period. You know, I've always thought about these non-infectious pulmonary syndromes as being second hit phenomena, which is that the lines are pr lung lungs are primed, and then something else happens, and and that causes an overwhelming inflammatory response that that manifests as these syndromes. So perhaps the role of BDP really is to um, subdue the 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 primed event or, or the initial event or, or the initial condition within the lungs and then hopefully depending on how long you treat with something like PDP you can push these events out far enough so that maybe they won't happen at all. You know in this initial study we're, we were so limited in terms of the, uh, the duration of therapy it was only 30 to 50 days that we can't really say at all what, what this might be and I think um, there's a lot of potential for additional studies here to look at exactly what the mechanisms might be um, um, and um, how long the duration, uh, duration of therapy should be, how, what, at what dose. Lots of questions, yeah. Uh, other questions? Yeah, Paul. Should we be use, thinking about using VDP to treat IPS or diffuse alveolar hemorrhage instead of prednisone? We use prednisone yeah. all the time. We can't yeah. wean people off their prednisone. It right. causes terrible toxicity. Um, I think that the, the, these data and these data are very compelling. Um, and um, I guess I, I think it, it's probably worthwhile considering. I'm not going to say that we should do it without a randomized trial. <laughs> but uh, but, but um, these data, it's very hard to argue with these data. I mean, we know 17 BMP gets into the pulmonary artery circulation. We know that we've got a lot of problems with prednisone therapy, especially for these syndromes where they're treating, the patients are being treated for you know, six to nine months to 12 months. It would be great if we can use an alternative drug where, where uh, it's directly delivered to the lungs at very high doses, very potent, high potency, and mi completely minimizes the systemic of side effects. So I assume there wasn't a difference in infectious events. There was not a, a significant difference. Right. So it was similar. Jason, I was at a meeting this weekend for the Seattle Scleroderma Foundation, which has a lot of amazing science. And one of the speakers was from Stanford, who's basically the maven for rejection after lung transplants. And she pointed out that when they look at their models and stuff and they test their patients, beside the airways being infected, there's basically destruction of the distal capillary bed. And I wondered if you have any data regarding that and pressures and stuff in our patients with chronic GVHD? Hmm. I, I don't. Um, I mean, Bob would be the best person to ask. I mean, he's looked at all these great slides that he has. No evidence. I, you know, I think that the other attraction about BDP is that it, it really delivers the drug from the side that we want. So, you know, we've been thinking a lot about, you know, how can we get low... Um, well, at least from the pulmonary side, you know, a lot of the studies in asthma and COPD are very focused about delivering steroids directly to the lungs via inhalation. Uh, but that's, there, there are limitations to that in, in terms of being able to get enough steroids far down enough, especially for some of these diseases where uh, you know, the, the, the process is really at the alveolar level and the capillary level. So being able to deliver this drug effectively from the opposite side, you know, from the capillaries to the interstitium, um, I think is we're actually, we may actually have um, a higher likelihood of gaining benefit. I'd like to ask you one more question, Jason. Going back to the beginning of your talk, um, you had the premise that earlier treatment of um, new onset airflow obstruction may potentially benefit the outcome. Um, Jones' article back in Annals of Internal Medicine in the late 80s showed that there was reversibility in about 11% of cases. Uh, do you have a sense for how early detection has or may modify that number? Yeah, so um, I think you know, those were really astute observations that uh, Joan made way back then because, um, because there, <clears throat> although, and I think it may be unique to those, to, to, to very few centers because there are very few centers who actually monitor lung function 
that closely. Um, and when you do monitor lung function closely, you will be able to detect these cases a lot earlier. So, so one of the major hurdles that um, I think we have to make or, or, or cross over is, is um, convincing the community that uh, the lung function really needs to be, especially in a high risk population, so people who, are, for instance, leave here with chronic GVHD, uh, they need to have their lung function monitored more uh, frequently than, than usual. And in that uh, big uh, flow chart that I showed, on there we had suggested that um, everybody gets their lung function measured at least every three months within the first year. Uh, and I think uh, Mary's been able to implement that very well here so that patients are now going out or leaving the center with that recommendation. And if they're stable during that first year, I think their risk does increase somewhat. So, so we back off on it and we do it every six, week, six months after, uh, during the second year. And, and the whole idea here being that if the more we monitor it, the, the uh, more likely we'll be able to detect these early changes. Um, we, from, a, from an anecdotal perspective, I know that if we treat too late, it's not reversible. And I think those reversible cases that Joan found earlier were also people who had their obstruction detected earlier, and we were able to get them treated earlier. Other questions for Jason? Okay, thank you, Jason. Very nice job.